episode of Translated Japanese Horror Stories. <laughs> In this episode, we will be reading a story called The Public Telephone. Public telephones. We have them. Never seen anyone ever use them. Don't know why they still exist, but it's still a thing. Anyhow, I hope you guys are in your comfy pajamas, with your head against the pillow, with some headphones on, and ready for a good story. Without further ado, let's begin. The Public Telephone This might seem out of the blue, but I'm not good with phone calls. It's not because phone calls are bothersome or that emails are more convenient. Every time a phone call comes in, my heart clenches, as if it's being gripped tightly. During one summer vacation, there were five of us. Marui, Takashima, Ise, Tema, and me. The usual gang. And as usual, we were at a loss for what to do. The light of the summer convenience store attracts a multitude of insects and plenty of idle high schoolers, and I'm one of them. The convenience store has an impressive parking lot. During times when not many people come, I've become accustomed to chatting with the store clerks. Although I have to say, the store manager of that convenience store was an acquaintance. He had a casualness typical of rural areas. Is there anything interesting to do? Someone would say that line at least once a day. Nothing, really. Someone would respond with the same number of replies. However, that day was a little different from usual. Well, if you guys have nothing to do, I heard an interesting story from this person. Why don't you go there? The convenience store manager said that to us and introduced us to a taxi driver. So, there's this public phone, and the mysterious rumor is that ghosts appear sometimes, or not. That's what the taxi driver said, starting the conversation. You know, it's, it's famous among us. You know that, um, that XX Cemetery? There's a mountain path behind it, right? They say there's a public phone there. It's closer to take that route to get on the highway, so when there's a long-distance passenger, they usually go that way. And I've never seen it myself, but they say it's active around the Obon season, so this time of year might just be right. And to clarify for those who don't know, Obon is a season during the summer where um, families and relatives would go visit their loved dead ones in their grave. That's what open season is. So, at that time, as the popularity of mobile phones increased, the number of public phones gradually decreased, making them rare. When we heard that story, everyone's reaction was either to go there for something to do or to kill time. It was a situation where there weren't many options, and if you were told to choose between going or not, anyone would choose to go reluctantly. We were in that kind of psychological state as well, and it took us an hour by bicycle. Passing through a long tunnel along the way, we arrived at our destination. A single white light in complete darkness. There were no street lights around, and the presence of the public phone booth stood out unnaturally. We gathered around, commenting on this and that, saying things like, So, this is it? After making a commotion for a while, whether we were satisfied or simply bored, someone signaled that it was time to go back, and we got on our bicycles. And at that moment, ring, the public phone rang. We were frozen by the resounding sound. It was a late realization, but the road near the cemetery was eerily devoid of cars and people, shrouded in silence. It was midnight on a rural mountain road. It's darker than you can imagine being in the mountains. 
only the fluorescent light of the public phone illuminates the surrounding. The regular sounds seem strangely loud. Paradoxically, the loud sound of the public phone only emphasizes the silence. Ring! The public phone continued to ring urgently, and we began to think that someone had to answer the call. In hindsight, I think we should have run away at that moment. However, at that time, we were caught up in the idea that we had to answer the phone, as if it were a test of courage. Hey, you answer it. No, well, you should. We repeated such exchanges while trembling with fear. The sound of the public phone didn't stop ringing. Well, I'll answer it. Marui, who was the leader among us, said, Nervously approaching the phone, he opened the door. Some people may not know, but most public phone booths can only accommodate one person. Spacious one designed for accessibility are not commonly found in places like this. Despite being packed tightly, we all squeezed inside. I think we were scared of being alone. At least, that's how I felt. Leaving the door opened, Marui picked up the receiver so that we could all hear. And they seemed to be saying something. I couldn't understand it. It was difficult to make out, but I could tell there was someone on the other end. They seemed to be repeating something. They keep repeating those words. Eventually, the call ended. Well, at first it was kind of scary, but I guess it kind of ended up being anticlimactic. Marui said that and hung up the receiver. I also put on a brave face and said something like, We got an interesting story out of it. The next day, everyone had forgotten about it. We gathered at the convenience store as usual and started asking each other, Anything interesting happening? Two days later, Marui died. We were completely bewildered by the sudden news. Even after the wake and funeral, we couldn't say a word. Marui's older brother said, I've, I've, I've heard a lot about you guys. Thank you for being friends with Marui until now. And that was when we finally shed tears. We didn't go to the convenience store this time. We talked at the family restaurant. Maybe it was because we were still wearing mourning clothes from the funeral, but we wanted to have a proper conversation. It's, it still doesn't feel real that he's gone, Isa said, not mentioning that he had passed away, just that he's no longer here. Yeah, when was the last time we saw him? At, at the convenience store, right? He was always at the convenience store, huh? <laughs> the others weakly laughed along with him. I think we wanted to somehow cope with this feeling of loss. Everyone laughed and said, Me too, me too. I wonder what Kataromi was, someone said. It seemed like everyone wanted to avoid facing the fact that Marui had died. They were trying to steer the conversation in a silly direction, saying things like, I don't understand, or there are no ghosts or anything like that. Maybe it was some kind of an advertisement for a car dealership, like Car Convenience Club? No, maybe it was a signal check for the phone? But the static was really bad, considering. We all made an effort to keep the conversation light and nonsensical as we laughed. Kartomi, 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 Three more days? What the hell is going on? What the hell is that? Three days. Marui died three days after we went to the public phone booth. And two hours later, we were in front of the public phone booth. If it turned out that Marui died because of this phone booth, we had to avenge him. 
Everyone was holding bats and hammers in their hands. High school students in mourning attire riding bicycles with weapons must have looked quite strange, and we waited until nightfall. Ring! The phone rang. No one said a word. Issei stepped forward and entered the booth. We followed suit. Squeezed tightly together, the door was left open again. Hello? We couldn't hear anything from the other side of the receiver. Only a mechanical sound, like a deep beep, could be heard. We waited for a while, but all we heard were static noises, and the call was disconnected. Hey, maybe it was just a coincidence? Car headlights from the other side of the tunnel illuminated us, rushing past. Thanks to that light, what we were doing now felt strangely embarrassing. Right? I mean, what are we, anyway? We look ridiculous. Issa laughed, and we laughed too. We felt a sense of guilt because we couldn't do anything about Marui's death. We wanted to find some reason for it. There's no such thing as a ghost, right? I mean, Marui wouldn't be done in by something like that. <laughs> ring, ring. The phone rang. We looked at each other and fell silent. The first one to move was Takashima. Takashima picked up the receiver and pressed it against his ear. I can't hear you. Speak louder. With a click, the call ended. Two more days. Tema mattered. Two days? Are you seriously believing this crap? I'm not going to die in two days, am I? Right? It wasn't clear who he was talking to, but Takashima shouted like that. Yeah, you're right, sorry. Tema apologized, and Issa and I also voiced our complaints. It's just a coincidence. Yeah, probably a crossed line or something. Yeah, you're right. We all laughed. Two days later, Takashima died. After Takashima's funeral, we headed to the convenience store that had become our gathering place. We wanted to find out about the taxi driver from the store manager, Ise, Tema, and myself. We used to be a group of five friends, but now only three remained. Something that was there just a little while ago was now gone. It wasn't a feeling of loneliness or uneasiness, but rather the absence of something taken for granted. It was like losing an arm and a leg. We arrived at the convenience store. The store manager looked at us, then handed us three bottles of cola with a sad expression on his face. <sighs> oh, that's a shame. Store manager, do you happen to know the contact information of the taxi driver? Uh, you mean the guy from the other day? I don't know. Do you have some business with him? Well, I want to ask him about the public phone. Well, the public phone? Well, don't forget it. All right, got it. I'll email you guys next time you come. It was a bit late, but the store manager and we exchanged our mobile addresses. A week passed, then two weeks later, but we didn't receive any messages. We no longer had the habit of going to the convenience store. Then my phone rang. I'm here now. It was Issa. She said that and hung up without waiting for a response. Hello and I rode my bicycle. How many times have I traveled this road? Every time I pass through this road, a friend dies. Only the light from the solitary public phone illuminates the road. There's nothing around. Nothing? No one was there. Ring! Ring! The sound of that bell-like phone ringing in the dark night. Since nothing else was visible in the darkness, my eyes were naturally drawn to the source of that sound. It's scary, and my legs trembled. With a clatter, a strange sound resonates, and it enters the booth, and with a soft click, the door closes. Right in front of me, the phone rings loudly. I lift the receiver with it trembling hands, but I can put it to my ear. 
It murmurs softly. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. On my other hand, I take out my mobile phone and try to call Ise. Damn it. No signal at a time like this. I try to escape from the booth, but when I put my hand on the door, it doesn't budge. Earlier it made such a light sound, but now it's as if it turned into a wall and won't budge at all. The receiver keeps murmuring incessantly. Enough already. Someone help me. I bang on the door frantically. Someone. Anyone. Thump, thump. In my line of sight, I can see feet. I instinctively raise my head, but I can't see the face. I try to scream for help, but then I realize that there's feet. His feet aren't wearing anything. No one walks barefoot in the mountains. Furthermore, I understand from that whiteness that it's not a person who can help me. I'm terrified. Thump, 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 thump. The box's glass is intermittently pounded. I can't see the figure. However, at that moment, the thump sound occurs. A palm emerges from the darkness. Thump, thump. feeble sound like tapping on a window pane. Just when I thought it rang in front of me, it's actually being struck from behind. From various direction, the thump thump sound accompanies the palm, yearly white feet, hands, and that's all I can see. Outside it's pitch black and nothing can be seen. The receiver continues to murmur softly. In this narrow space, it feels like my sanity is slipping away. Through the gap in my feet, a strangely long-fingered palm enters swiftly, and then it retreats swiftly. The hand enters again and retreats again. One, two, with each repetition, they multiply. Are, 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 they, are they searching for me? No, no, I, I don't want it. I try to avoid and evade their touch, their palms. So many hands, so many hands. Swiftly, swiftly many hands appeared and disappeared at my feet. The receiver murmurs softly, please, please stop, I'm sorry. I instinctively respond. The palm that was about to grab me swiftly withdrew into the darkness. A voice is heard from the receiver. Oh no, yeah. I helplessly lost all strength from my body. At that moment, a deafening roar echoed in my ears, crackling the sound of glass shattering. Glass shards scattered on my face and clothes. Isa and Tema were breaking the box. Hey, are you alright? I thought I was saved, and then I collapsed on the spot. Once we arrived at the convenience store and calmed down, I sipped hot coffee, even though it was summer, and we talked. The stories told by the two of them didn't align with mine. According to them, they only saw me thrashing inside the box. A person? Hands? They didn't know. Moreover, Issei didn't make any calls to me in the first place. There was no record of Issei's name in my call history. Why did I assume that voice belonged to Issei in the first place? It was strangely flat woman-like voice without any inflection. Issa tried to visit Tema's and my homes. He managed to contact Tema and they met up, but he couldn't reach me, so I thought. And he went to the public telephone. And when he arrived, he found out that I had been thrashing inside the box. It was a conclusion filled with mysteries. The taxi driver never came to that convenience store again. The store manager seemed to know the intention behind telling us the story, but he didn't tell us. And that voice won't leave my ears. I'm not good with phones. The end. Yeah, this one is horrifying. I mean, in Japan, we have these telephone boxes everywhere and it is always, always so ominous because it is so quiet. Even in the city, if you're in a residential area, Japan at night is so quiet and really peaceful because everyone respects the neighbor and your sound level, so they keep it quiet. But it's quiet, dark, and then 
in the middle of the street there is this light bulb kind of like oh glaring in the dark and to if it rings if it rings in the night if i'm like walking along and a telephone bird box telephone box rings in the night i am running away hell no this is a scary one i don't like this one too scary i'm not really sure how you guys are falling asleep to these stories but not for me too scary too scary anyhow um hope you can fall asleep (laughs) and if not well I don't know what to say. Take care, guys. Drink some water. Maybe maybe watch some of my less scarier videos. And, um, yeah. Until next time.